is the UK is the UK Financial Intelligence Unit podcast. Hello and welcome to the UK Financial Intelligence Unit podcast. My name is David Maguire and I'm a senior officer in the UK FIU. We're a special edition of the podcast today, as I'll be speaking with one of the executive directors of the National Crime Agency, Graham Bigger, who's currently the Director General of the National Economic Crime Centre, or NEC. Graham was previously the National Security Director in the Home Office, and prior to that worked in the Ministry of Defence as Chief of Staff to the Defence Secretary. We'll be discussing the work and remit of the NEC, particularly with regards to the UK FIU's position in it, the headline figures from the 2020 Suspicious Activity Report's annual report, plans for the future of the UK FIU and the SARS regime, and how SARS can make a big difference in cutting serious organised crime. As with all our podcasts, no active or sensitive operational work is discussed, everything is at a public, not protectively marked level, and panellists' opinions are independently theirs. Graham, welcome to the podcast. So, Let's start first with the NEC, which the UK FIU is situated within. Now, the NEC was formed in 2018. For the benefit of our listeners, can you briefly describe what the NEC actually is? I mean, what it does and why it was formed? Yeah, sure. Thanks, um, David, and good to be here. Uh, So the National Economic Crime Centre was set up two years ago um, at the request of the government. Uh, It's a multi-agency centre based in the NCA, with representatives, secondees from all the major organisations um, in the public sector involved in fighting economic crime. Um, so that's the, 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 the NCA, obviously, the Serious Fraud Office, Financial Conduct Authority, uh, HMRC, Crime Prosecution Service, and the City of London Police. Um, and what we are trying to do is to get all of those organisations to work really well together with each other, and then with the private sector as well, to effect a step change in the fight against economic crime. It's a fairly small team in the scale of of, of these things, it's 100 people. So it's not about us doing investigations or gathering intelligence ourselves. It's about providing that kind of capping function that brings the organizations together and makes them more than the sum of their parts. So that's what the NEC is. Dane, on the the SARS aspect, um, just in relation to the annual report, the SARS annual report for 2020, uh, the UK FIU received over 500, 570,000 SARS, which was a 20% increase on the previous year. Uh, and there was an 81% increase in defence requests, over 62,000. Now, back in 2005, the UK FIU was receiving just shy of about 200,000 SARS and just over 9,000 consent SARS. That's an unprecedented increase. Can, they, can the UK FIU cope with these numbers if they're going to continue to rocket in this way? Uh, so not if we carry on doing the same things in the same way we've uh, we've done before. Um, so we have to adapt. It is a massive increase. I mean, I think w- one thing we need to look at quite hard is why there has been um, such such an increase. Is it there's just more money laundering happening? Is it um, that banks have got better systems? Uh, I mean, I say banks, of course, it's the, all the regulated sector, but the vast majority come from uh, the main retail banks. Um, Is it they've got better systems so they're identifying more? Is it that levels of risk have um, changed? People's uh, uh, tolerance for having uh, a suspicion without reporting it to the NCA. So we need to look at that and think about whether it's the right uh, amount of SARS coming in. And there'll be certainly a lot of people in the the banking sector in particular who say that they are reporting many more SARS than they think they should. They think they are low value SARS um, and they will be better spending the same amount of effort uh, in, in putting together more detailed packages around um, things that that are that are higher volume, higher value, and potentially higher higher threat. So there's work to be done there. One particular aspect of that um, that's worth drawing out is um, the, the fintech sector, the, the challenger banks. So if you look at the, the figures you just gave, um, and and there have been some pretty big increases there. Sixty four percent of the increase in SARS and over 80% of the increase in DAMLs in the consent SARS has come from the FinTech and Challenger Bank sector. So, I mean, obviously those sectors are growing, so you would expect the proportion to to increase, but it is disproportionate to that. So we need to understand a bit better why that is. Um, There's a slightly different legal framework that applies um, to the FinTech and Challenger Bank um, sector, and that's something that's being addressed through the Financial Services Act currently going through, through Parliament. 
So there's basically a lower threshold for all of those organizations uh, and more comes in. Uh, but there may also be something about um, culture and there may be something about their business processes that means they are putting more into us. So we have to have a, a really good conversation with those organizations and, and try and understand if that's the right number of SARS coming in from them or too many. And my sense it is, too, is that there, is, there are too many. So I think there are a number of things we can do to, to reduce the supply, the number of SARS coming in so that it focuses on the ones that are, are most important. But however we do that, there are still going to be a large number and considerably more than the figures you gave for 2005. And if you go back 10 years before that, it was you know, much, much less as well. So the numbers have been increasing very significantly. So whatever it ends up with, it will still be a large number. So we have to make some real changes and improvements to the way we manage that within uh, the FIU. And that's what we're embarked on uh, at the moment. We've, we've changed our processes so we can look at the consent SARS, the Defence Against Money Laundering SARS, much more quickly and get them out to the right bit of law enforcement um, to look at. Um, we've got more people into the FIU. We are more than 50% bigger than we were two years ago. Uh, and we're also um, putting new IT in place um, from, frankly, a, a legacy system that is, that is really creaking uh, to provide something that is a bit more state of the art and is going to allow us to manage that kind of volume um, better. So, a set of activities to try and reduce the number coming into a more manageable and value adding load, and then a set of things to better prepare us to deal with the ones that do come in. And these changes that you've, you've referenced, some that are happening now, some that are, are taking place on the horizon, um, are, are these under the umbrella of, of what's known as the SARS reform programme and SARS IT transformation? Yes, uh, they are. So. Um, I mean, SARS IT transformation is a project within the SARS reform program, just to, to clarify that. But yes, there is a SARS reform program um, that we are working on with the, uh, the Home Office primarily. They, they, they are um, funding it along with uh, the banks and we're working obviously really closely with um, the banks to make a number of changes. And some of, the ones, some of them are the ones that I've just spoken about. So improving uh, the IT. Uh, increasing the size of uh, uh, the financial intelligence unit and changing the processes around the way we do um, uh, DAMLs, Defence Against Money Laundering SARS. But it goes broader than that. It's also looking at the way we um, provide feedback to the different regulated sectors on the SARS they are providing, on the trends we are seeing, so that they can better pinpoint um, suspicion and, and report the things that matter. Uh, it's about an uplift in law enforcement in the regional organised crime units so that they can, uh, they can use SARS better. There's more people there to read them and spot the ones that, um, that really matter. And it's about improving the overall guidance that comes out from the Home Office, the, the legal framework for this. So again, we can all be as, uh, as effective as possible. So that's what the SARS, SARS reform program um, is about. And it, it really should, um, I mean, it has already, but it really should as it continues to be implemented, improve things for, uh, for everyone involved. So for the, the, the major banks, the bulk reporters, um, we will have a new API based system um, so that uh, reports can come into us in a much slicker um, fashion. Um, we will be providing better feedback to not just those big banks, but to all the regulated sectors, not on individual starts. We won't be able to, um, to do that with the volume we're getting, but on the trends we are seeing so that they can um, better target uh, what, they, what they provide to us. We're changing um, the IT, as I mentioned, within, within the FIU, so that we have the tools there to, to really draw the value out of, um, out of the SARS that, that is there to be had. You know, absolutely spotting indications of vulnerability, absolutely spotting patterns and networks within the SARS, and just doing the kind of analytical function that we'd all love to and aspire to do. And then we think we're also providing a better service out to, to law enforcement. And that's the model we operate with um, the FLU and SARS is that the SARS are av available to be looked at by people with the right qualifications across law enforcement. So we're going to provide a better portal out to law enforcement so they can access them and search them and search across them better. Um, and also increase the number of people out there who are doing it um, and provide better feedback to them again on, on what we are seeing. So there's a whole host of things there that. Um, is already making things better, but over the next couple of years, we'll make things substantially better. So is, is there a date when all of this looks like it'll be finished or is it just a case of as and when? 
so I mean, it'll it'll never be finished in in one sense. There's going to be have to be a rolling set of improvements. But we're looking um, to get the IT all in place over the course of, uh, or certainly the, the base IT in place over the course of the next year. Uh, the vast majority um, of that within this calendar year, um, we will um, finish the planned increase in recruitment uh, into the FIU, which will get us up to close to 200 people in the FIU, and it was 80 a couple of years ago. Uh, we will finish that in about um, 18 months' time. Um, and that's kind of phase one, really, of the SARS reform. I think there's a, a lot more we can do once we've got the beginnings of the tools in there to, to learn from what we are doing and, it, and improve the system. Um, and then there will be some legal changes that are coming, coming through as well, and they will take a bit longer. So over the next kind of year to 18 months, we'll get the, the bulk of, of this phase of the change in place. Then there'll be continuous improvement that goes on from there. So as, as head of the, the NEC, you're seeing the full picture of the financial crime landscape of the UK, as it were, uh, and, and the work that's going on across law enforcement to, to combat it. What, in your opinion, would you say is the, the UK FIU's uh, role in all this? So I think it's fundamental. It's it's a, such an important role. and. And it's not just off the, FI, the FIU itself, it's of the, the system that it sits at the heart of. So it's a fundamental important role that all the, the regulated sector, the, the banks and the lawyers and the accountants and the estate agents and so on are providing and the law enforcement using it. It's, it's a really, really powerful, um, powerful system. It's one of the richest intelligence sources uh, for law enforcement in the country. And there's so much more use we can, we can make of it. So just of itself, that's a really important thing. I think working then alongside the NEC, trying to be the, the coordinating brain for, for, economic, for economic crime fighting across the country, there is huge power in that as well. If we can use the data and the analysis and the expertise from the FIU to help inform the priorities of the NEC and, and vice versa, we can understand from the NEC and the broader intelligence that we look at where we need to be looking and then and then target that into the FIU. I think there's there's really important synergy to be had there. And then thirdly, it is part of what I spoke of earlier is getting the relationship with the private sector right in, in all its different manifestations. The FIU is a really important part of that. And the more feedback we can give out to the regulated sector from uh, fr from, from the FIU, uh, the more really good cases we can work through um, through Gimlet. The more intelligent sharing we can do, we can do generally about what we're seeing, the more what we can do to improve systems and target harden, as we as we call it, to reduce the risk of crime in the first place. There's an awful lot that can be done there to improve that relationship with the private sector. So I think the FIU is absolutely at the heart of it. And, and we saw that just to give an example um, during uh, the, the first months of, of COVID. And uh, I think... It, it was a real step forward in the way that we uh, that the FIU worked and the rest of us worked with the FIU. So we looked really closely at SARS that were coming in that um, that were related to COVID. Um, a, a lot of those were about um, uh, suspicious transactions involved in the, the procurement of um, PPE um, or or material for for, for hospitals. Um, it then moved on to look at applications that might be suspicious in relation to bounce back loans and uh, other other government grants. And we worked that data really hard and much harder than we would have done a year before or, the, or, or a couple of years before that. And not only did we work that data, we were discussing it every week with um, the major banks uh, and other parts of the private sector. So we had um, set up by the National Economic Crime Centre, but with the FIU absolutely part of it, a, a fusion cell, we called it, that was meeting every week with 30 different organizations represented. And we were doing a number of things in that, in that um, fusion cell, but one part of it was, was looking at the, the aggregation of SARS data that was coming in and trying to see what that told, told us. And it really gave uh, almost live times, you know, weekly feedback to the banks um, on what you know, they were reporting into us. And then we were able to play back what we were getting in, in totem into that. And it really helped and uh, you know it alerted us for example to some of the risks around bounce back loans which um, meant that we were able to go into central government and uh, raise some concerns with them um, it allowed us uh, to, to work with the NHS and the Department of Health and Social Care to alert them to 
uh, contracts that they were close to signing that looked like they might be suspicious and just make sure they were aware of any concerns around it. And, and lots of them, by that quick interchange of information between the banks and the FIU and then DHSC or the NHS, were able to be resolved really quickly um, and allowed contracts to proceed quickly and therefore get what the NHS needed more quickly. And then some of them actually turned into be something that, that really could have been fraud and were able to be stopped. But it was a really powerful example of what the FIU can do at its best when we join it up with the NEC and the banking sector and the, the rest of government. I'm glad you mentioned COVID because obviously that's one of the major news issues of the last 12 months. Um, obviously also one of the other main news issues uh, for the last few years has been Brexit. And I wanted to ask you about the UK FIU and the, the work that it does with international partners. Is, is that going to end or be affected with Brexit? Uh, so definitely not end. It has been slightly affected. I mean, to take one step back, um, uh, FIUs obviously exist in pretty much every country in the world, and there's something really important and valuable about working across all those uh, different financial intelligence units in, in different countries. It's not something in the UK that we have been as good at as we should have been. It's a consequence, frankly, of just not having enough resources uh, in the FRU and the number of SARS going up, we always wanted to do it, but there just wasn't quite the capacity to do it. And, you know, it's something that we've been criticised uh, for before in, in various places, but including in the Financial Action Task Force uh, Mutual Evalu Evaluation Report a couple of years ago. So it's something we've been really working on trying to improve. Um, and I think we, we have been getting a lot better at that. So not just in the, 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 the tactical passing of information from one uh, to the other, um, but also in trying to do analytical and thematic work with different uh, FIUs in different countries around particular issues. Uh, an example of what we've done there has been working with the Australians uh, and, uh, uh, and the Philippines on um, child sexual exploitation in the Philippines. And it's a, a horrible manifestation of, of modern life that people pay to see child sexual abuse live streamed from uh, the, the, the Philippines and something that from the NCA more generally we've been trying really hard to, to stamp down on. But there's a crucial role for financial intelligence in that because people are paying for it and you are seeing through PayPal or other, other pay mechanism these, these payments going out to the Philippines. And if we can get the right triggers into banks uh, and the right information coming into FRU, it provides brilliant leads for our child sexual exploitation teams here in Australia, in the Philippines. So there was a really good bit of, of joint work that we did with them uh, with those three countries together uh, to, to identify what the trigger words would be, to get the right kind of guidance out to uh, other countries and to and to banks. And it's made a real difference to child sexual exploitation um, in the Philippines. So that's something I'm really proud of. Um, so yeah, we're trying to do stuff more generally uh, internationally, and there's been some really good successes. You asked specifically about Brexit. Um, so it has had uh, a bit of an effect. Um, we were plugged into other EU member states, uh, states through FIU.net, um, which is hosted by, by Europol, um, which is, is moving to the Commission as it happens. Um, but one consequence of us leaving the EU is that we would not have automatic access to that, to that system. And that just meant that our ability to automatically pass information across to EU member states um, uh, was, was removed. Um, it's not a disaster. It just means that we have a little bit more work to do in, uh, in, in identifying uh, SARS that look like they're going to be relevant to other EU member states and then, and then getting them over to them and transferring them to them. Um, and it, it just involves more manual uh, interaction. And uh, we recruited some extra people into the FRU to do that. And that seems to be working um, relatively well. Um, it's still you know, fairly early days, um, but that's the kind of process change that we've had to do. Um, we, we have not sensed any um, stepping back from other EU member states and their desire to work with us or their willingness to um, to work with us in combating crime, uh, not in the FRU and, and frankly not across law enforcement either. Um, you've got police forces and law enforcement agencies in all of those countries who just want to fight crime and they'll work with anyone um, who's prepared to do that with them. So from that point of view, um, we're, we're, we're still cracking on and, and making good progress. Excellent. Thank you. And you mentioned two key pieces of, of analytical work that the UK FIU has been involved in, the, the COVID uh, analysis uh, and also the Philippines and the Australian work. And you mentioned that analysis is one of the things that been, is being looked at, at being improved as part of the changes which are taking place. 
are there any aspects uh, of analytical work that you'd be kind of expecting or, or wanting the UK FIU to be looking at going forward? So, I mean, I think the, the main thing is that we need to be doing more of it. Uh, we didn't have the, uh, the capacity in terms of headcount or the IT to enable really sophisticated analysis. Um, and, we're, and we're getting both. Um, and we're also, as part of the National Crime Agency, the National Crime Agency's developing a national data exploitation capability. It's about two years old now and, and really maturing. And the combination of the analysis we can do in the FIU and the analysis we can do using SARS data with the national data exploitation capability, it's really quite exciting. Um, so we can really then get the richness and the power out of uh, the material that we are, we are provided with. So just generally, we need to be doing more. What, what I would say, and a kind of final point in that, it, it's not just for the FRU to do um, the analysis. Uh, we've clearly got a responsibility there and we'll have some capability. But one of the reasons we have the model we have in the UK, where it is open to, to law enforcement generally, is to allow um, other parts of law enforcement to do that analysis themselves. So we really want those capabilities to grow. One really good example of that um, is HMRC, um, who obviously have access to the suspicious activity reports. Um, they did a series of analysis and compared it with some of their data. And in uh, the last year that we were reported on, um, as a result of that analysis, they managed to save 56 million pounds. So there's some really great wins that we can have out of doing more analysis and we're really focused on doing it. To end, is there, is there anything else you want to get across or, or just stress which we've, we've not covered? So I think it's worth saying, and people may have seen this, the SARS annual report, but um, uh, we talk about the number of SARS going up and that, you know, that's a big issue uh, for banks because it costs uh, to do them uh, and for us because we, we have to look at them. But more important really is the, the benefit we get out of having those SARS. And, um, you know, last year uh, we restrained or, or removed from criminals 172 million pounds um, as a result of Defence Against Money Laundering SARS. And that was three times, over three times more than what we'd done two years before. Uh, and 172 million pounds, of which 100 million was investigations that were entirely new to law enforcement. They only started because of that SAR. So sometimes, and it's brilliant, SARS can come in and augment existing investigations. That's, that's fantastically helpful. Um, but at, they do start new investigations too. So it's really important for people to to know that and you know if you're playing a part in the overall SARS regime to be to be proud of what you're contributing to. I think the main uh, message you know I have out to the, to the regulated sector is do keep thinking about your responsibilities uh, in relation to SARS um, under the, the money laundering um, regulations and be really focused on on that value that is being added and be confident that we are working really hard to make the system work better and work better for you. My message out to, to law enforcement would be, this is an amazing intelligence resource. And some of you in law enforcement are using it really, really well. Um, and some bits, frankly, less well, uh, but get in there, see what is possible and, and use it. We have a, a fairly unique model in the UK of, of having the data open to law enforcement. So take advantage of it. Our message into the FRU is, um, thank you so much for what you're doing. It's, it's fantastically hard work at times. The volume is, uh, is enormous. And we're at the stage at the moment where we are implementing a new change program, which always takes more effort, but we're really getting there um, and, uh, and just hold on in there. In, in a year's time, life is going to be a lot better. But what great work we're doing at the moment, and we should all be really proud of it. Thank you, Graham. Well, that brings us to the end of this special edition of the UK FIU podcast. The SARS annual report, which we discussed, is available on the National Crime Agency website, as well as the UK FIU magazine, SARS in Action, which also covers a lot of the topics discussed here today. I'd like to thank our guest, Graham Bigger, and don't forget, you can provide us with feedback and suggestions for future podcast topics via our Twitter and LinkedIn pages. These sites are the best place to keep up to date with our upcoming podcasts, webinars and products. So, until next time... I've been David Maguire, and this has been a UK FIU podcast. This is the UK, is the UK Financial Intelligence Unit podcast.